Coming up on Network Africa. Fight erupts in eastern DR Congo despite truce. At least 20 people killed in uprising. Rwanda's ex-minister of youth and culture, Edward Bamperiki, is jailed for corruption. Plus, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in South Africa for talks as part of a three-nation Africa tour. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Joke Rogers in Lagos. Today we begin in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where fresh fighting has erupted despite an agreement between the government and rebel groups to end the hostilities. The fighting between the army and M23 rebels is said to have caused many people to flee their homes. The military has not commented on the latest fighting, but a spokesperson for the rebels accused the government of forces of attacking their positions as they prepared further withdrawals, as outlined in an agreement reached in Angola's capital, Luanda. Last week in Davos, Switzerland, President Felix Tshisekedi said the rebel group is, is not uh, withdrawing but moving around and redeploying to other areas. The rebels have accused the president of being more keen on destroying the M23 than peacefully resolving the conflict. According to the UN, more than 400,000 people have fled their homes in the conflict since last year. Staying in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a suspected rebel attack also in the east of the country has killed at least 20 people. This happened yesterday. Local officials said fighters from the Allied Democratic Forces raided a village overnight. They killed people in a bar before looting several homes and shops and setting them on fire. The attack was in the Beni area of North Kivu province. The ADF rebels, who are allied to the Islamic State group, have killed hundreds of people in assaults and bombings in eastern DR Congo. The Ugandan and Congolese armies have been fighting rebel groups in a joint offensive in the region where there has been militia violence for decades. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has been defending mega-projects undertaken since he took power, saying they were not to blame for economic turmoil that has seen the currency plummet and inflation accelerate. Since Sisi became president in 2014, Egypt has embarked on an infrastructure splurge spearheaded by the military that has included the expansion of the Suez Canal, the construction of a new capital in the desert and extensive road building. Critics have requested why the government poured tens of billions of dollars into the projects at a time when Egypt has struggled to contain its debt burden and provide public services such as health and education to a growing population. The Suez Canal underwent a first expansion in 2015 and is now being expanded again. President Sisi also made reference to investments in the power grid early in, the, in his rule, which resulted in a large power surplus. Let's get more on this. Joining us now is the VOA's Edward Geranian in Cairo for us. Edward, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me, Joe Kay. Right, so tell us who is criticizing President Al Sisi's projects? Well, the biggest critics are usually from the Muslim Brotherhood who are based outside the country. They are the ones who would like to come back to power, and they have a number of countries that sponsor and support them. Uh, the easiest ones to name are Qatar and Turkey, and they have a, an extensive media outlet uh, that are run out of Qatar and Turkey, um, TV stations, and uh, they have vocal critics, which are usually from the Muslim Brotherhood. So not to discount any internal criticism, I mean, some people, um, influential people perhaps, were not too keen on some of these projects. I say some of the projects because uh, the capital, uh, the new capital has had its critics inside the country. Um, but at the same time, it usually seems like we're hearing a lot of noise about there being economic problems and political problems coming from these same sources which are based outside the country and that would like to come back to power and are supported by foreign countries. So uh, it's a mixed bag. I mean, there are, there are various critics and there are things to criticize. And at the same time, you have to admit that the world economic situation has uh, become very difficult given the 
Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine conflict that sprang up very not last year and the COVID uh, crisis, which has affected a lot of Arab countries and a lot of African countries. Uh, so I don't think Egypt is alone. Um, economically, a lot of the things that Egypt, the revenue stream Egypt was counting on, uh, tourism, uh, some of that, maybe not all of it, but some of it is dried up. Uh, we have foreign countries uh, that have helped to help it dry up. I mean, uh, organizations like MasterCard and Visa uh, cutting off the use by Russian tourists. And uh, that was one main rate revenue stream uh, for Egypt. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of reasons. Uh, but there are, there are critics both inside and outside the country. That's true. Some of the issues, Edward, I believe, is that some of those projects have had huge cost implications where the funds taken, do you think the funds were taken from the government coffers or were they borrowed monies? Uh, my experience with various projects is they're all funded differently. I mean, the government, uh, when it was rebuilding or expanding the Suez Canal the first time, uh, put out um, a, a domestic, um, what do you call it, a tender. People were, were lending money, they're, they're Egyptians. Uh, to finance the project. Um, you have a lot of monies that come in from Gulf countries for various projects, uh, including electrical issues. Uh, parts of the, the electrical grid that were rebuilt, uh, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, probably not unfortunately, but uh, they were funded by European countries, which expect to be paid in dollars, I, I assume, as usual. Um, so that's the revenue stream that's, that's become a problem, the dollars, because uh, dollars are not coming in as they were before. And you can trace that once again to the world crisis, crises, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, as President Sisi points out himself, and the COVID um, virus. Um, so a lot of reasons, different reasons, different funding. Um, and what comes out of government coffers, I mean, countries like the United Arab Emirates, usually they finance things in a different sort of way. So they're not going through the regular structure. So Gulf countries finance various projects in a different sort of way. But, you know, from your interaction with, with the people, aren't they happy with the development so far? I mean, they're projects that are supposed to make their lives easier. Uh, well, that's true. I mean, I, I think a lot of people are not happy. Uh, they're not happy because of inflation. Uh, well, you know, people are not happy in much of the world right now. You can just see that on the news. Uh, but you don't have people saying that we want to overthrow the Biden government. Uh, maybe you do. I, I, I don't want to say that. Uh, but uh, because the economy in the U.S. is not so good, I mean, it's uh, you have a, a media chorus that's, that's springs up whenever there's a problem in Egypt that's uh, kind of predictable, whereas in other countries you don't always have that, uh, even though you do have a lot of domestic critics. And so the 2011 Arab uprising, the Arab Spring, you know, did take its toll on Egypt's government, politics, and of course uh, the economy. Uh, what have you observed about how it has been able to rise from that? Well, a lot of these projects have improved uh, people's lives. The electric electricity grid uh, in when the Muslim Brotherhood was in power was uh, constantly failing. We were constantly having brownouts back in 2012 and 2013. Uh, so the government really had to do something when uh, they came, when President Sisi uh, took power. Um, the Suez Canal is a natural source of revenue, so it's an, it's kind of logical that you would want to expand it. Uh, building housing, as they've done in a lot of places, uh, is also a, a, a constant demand of the people um, and of outside critics as well. And so they've done that. It's cost a lot of money. Um, and you've had uh, the, this capital, which uh, many people don't like. Um, but at the same time, historically, various Egyptian rulers over the years, over the centuries, I should say, have built new capitals. It's, uh, it's not a new thing. Um, maybe it was a bit extravagant. Maybe 
Uh, maybe that's part of the problem. I'm sure it is. I know it is. But uh, it's not the only problem. And I, I think if the economy in the world were going smoothly, as people might have expected a couple years ago, uh, you wouldn't have seen this kind of uh, economic crisis here in Egypt. All right. Thanks again, Edward, for that update. My pleasure. Let's head on to Rwanda, where High Court has sentenced a former youth and culture minister to five years in prison over corruption charges, extending a previous sentence by a year. The original sentence, which came last year against Edward Bampuriki, was a rare case of a top official convicted over corruption in the country. He was suspended from cabinet last May and put under house arrest while being investigated for corruption and misuse of power remained under house arrest until this ruling. Bamporiki confessed to the charges on Twitter and asked President Paul Kagame for forgiveness. But in September, a court sentenced him to four years, which he appealed. The 39-year-old poet and filmmaker was previously a vigorous supporter of President Kagame and the ruling party and rose rapidly through the ranks. And now to South Africa, where the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is visiting on the latest stage of a three-nation African tour aimed at boosting U.S. influence. The tour, which also included Senegal and Zambia, comes as Washington faces growing competition in the region with Russia and China. South Africa has recently taken over the chair of the BRICS economic group, made up of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa to sacrifice a counterweight to U.S. global dominance. While in South Africa, Ms. Yellen is expected to push President Cyril Ramaphosa to pursue plans for a gradual transition away from a heavy reliance on coal to cleaner energy. Kenya's opposition leader, Raila Odinga, has said that his political coalition does not recognize William Ruto as the president of Kenya and declared the new Kenyan government as illegitimate. Mr. Ruto beat him in last August poll, but Mr. Odinga, who appeared at Nairobi's Kamukunji Stadium along with his running mate, Martha Karua, and other allies, repeated claims that the results were manipulated, claims that had already been rejected in court. The 2022 election was Mr. Odinga's fifth attempt at the presidency, where he was beaten by Mr. Ruto, who was declared winner in the absence of four election commissioners who dissented and accused the commission chairman of delivering what they called opaque results. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, has condemned the brutal killing of leading Espartini human rights lawyer, Tulani Maseko, who was shot dead in his home on January 21st in the presence of his wife and children. Saif Maganko, OHCR spokesman, said Tulani Maseko was a stalwart of human rights who, at great risk to himself, spoke up for many who couldn't speak up for themselves. He added that Maseko's cold-blooded killing was deprived, has deprived the Eswatini Southern Africa and the world of a true champion and advocate for peace, democracy and human rights. Maseko was the chairperson of the Multi-Stakeholder Forum, an umbrella association of civil society organizations, business and trade unions, political parties, faith-based organizations, and women's organizations that advocates for a peaceful transition to multi-party democracy in Eswatini. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, today condemned the brutal killing of leading Eswatini human rights lawyer, Tulani Maseko, who was shot dead in his home on 21 January in the presence of his wife and children. Tulani Maseko was a stalwart of human rights, who, at great risk to himself, spoke up for many who couldn't speak up for themselves. We at the UN Human Rights Office offer our sincere condolences to his family, friends, and colleagues. His cold-blooded killing has deprived Iswatini, Southern Africa, and the world of a true champion and advocate for peace, democracy, and human rights. We call on the authorities in the Kingdom of Eswatini to ensure a prompt, independent, impartial and effective investigation is held into his killing in accordance with the Eswatini Constitution and international human rights law 
and to hold all those responsible to account in fair trials. Still ahead on the program. Uganda has high hopes as it commences drilling of the first oil well. Details in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Uganda has started drilling its first oil well in the Kingfisher oil field. The state's petroleum agency, which put the news out today, says it hopes that by 2025, the first of a potential 1.4 billion barrels of oil will be pumped from wells across the Midwestern region. The Kingfisher oil field is operated by China's Sinoc, while the second Tilenga oil field is operated by France's Total Energies. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, opened the Ocean Race Summit uh, yesterday in Mindelo, where he and Cape Verde Prime Minister uh, were presented with the nature's baton by Ocean Race competi competitor and team Melisa skipper Boris Herman. As part of his address on the West African island, uh, Mr. Guterres urged for more action to be taken by world leaders to tackle the ongoing global ocean emergency. Together with the Carella e Silva, Guterres had previously met with the teams participating in this year's o Oceans Race to discuss ocean health. Let's move on now on day two of the Festival of Projects Commissioning in Lagos State. Here in Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari unveiled the first phase of the Lagos Blue Line project and the contract signing for the construction of the second phase. According to the Lagos State Governor, Baraji Sonwulu, the rail transport system in the state will reduce traffic congestion on the roads. The president also commissioned the J. Randall Cultural Center that will promote the richness of Yoruba culture and history. We're commissioning here today is a product of timeless vision by Lagos State, a vision that dates back 20 years. On one of the greatest legacies was developing a comprehensive roadmap for the future of Lagos, one that is laid out of the clear pathway for a modern, prosperous, and globally competitive mega city. Lagos Strategic Transport Master Plan. STMP was envisioned as a six metro line of which the blue line, which is a 27 kilometer running from Marina to Kokomaiko, was the first that we're completing. Over the years, the journey has been eventful and many challenges have been surmounted, including lack of support from previous government, especially the PDP government. When we were, when they were in power, it is no secret that the only ambition that a party was to capture Lagos, but not to give us the necessary support. But with your government, we have received tremendous, tremendous support, especially on the Lagos Badagri Express route, which is the main corridor for this rail project. This made it clear, including on constitutional holding of funds, you know, at critical times for Lagos State. But we have moved on, and Lagos is continuing the rising, and we're beginning to see big, bold development happening under your watch. Thankfully, those dark days are behind us. The completion of this blue line here, the first rail system by a sub-national in Africa with a sea crossing. Mr. President, you will cross sea with this rail track. You know, it's a testament that indeed the dark days of oppression are behind us as a government. And what you'll be commissioning today is the first phase between Marina here to Okokomaiko, and we will sign, you know, the phase two in another few minutes um, from now. This phase one, like Mr. Deputy Governor said, has five stations. From here in Marina, it goes to National Theater, Igombun Station, Alaba Station, Orile Station, and Maltu Station. They're expected to cover just less than 15 minutes as compared to a journey time that hitherto will take about an hour and a half to two hours. The benefits, Mr. President, are obvious. It will reduce travel time, it will improve the quality of life of our citizens, and it will make Lagos one of the most resilient mega city, not only in Africa, but it will compete with other mega cities in the world. 
Well, today concludes the second day of the president's state visit to Lagos, where he commissioned a host of projects. And uh, on day one of his visit to the state, President Mohamed Buhari commissioned two projects, the Leki Deep Sea Port and uh, the Lagos Rice Mill in Imota, Ikorodu. He commended the Lagos state government for taking a bold step towards becoming self-sufficient in food production. President Muhammadu Buhari lands at the Muritala Mohammed International Airport, Ikeja, for the commissioning of infrastructural projects embarked upon by the administration of Governor Bapajide Sonwulu. The president heads to his first assignment for the day, the Leki Deep Sea Port an investment in excess of about $1.5 billion, a joint venture between the federal government, Lagos State, and other private partners. The operator for this project is one of the biggest in the world, and we're happy that this is happening in your time, because it all started within your time, and it's been completed within your time as well. We're indeed excited that um, the size of the vessels that will be coming in here um, will be up to four times um, the size of vessels that are currently built at both Tinta and Papa Portis. The next stop is the Lagos Rice Mill, located in the Imota area of Ikorodu. The president moves round the facility, a 32 metric ton per hour rice mill capacity, the largest in Africa and the third largest in the world, which is expected to create employment for the people. There are two lines, Mr. President. That's the second line. This is the first line, right. So there are two production lines. This is one line, that's the second line. Right. And Bula is known to be the world best um, um, rice um, equipment in the entire world. And that's what we have here. This can only happen based on your rice revolution, Mr. President, where you said we should eat what we grow and we should grow what we eat. And that's what we're demonstrating here in Lagos. We don't have the land. We're begging KBC to give us more land, but we're partnering with all of our other states that have the land for rice paddy. After the rice facility tour, Governor Sonwolu says Lagos is ready to support the rice revolution for Nigeria. It's been done because of the agricultural revolution of Mr. President, who when he started his government, he says Nigeria should grow what they eat and they should eat what they grow. We're happy that Lagos is a testament for that. With 2.8 million bags of 50 kg rice per annum, Lagos is ready to support the rice revolution and the food revolution in Nigeria. And then we have With the, the Lagos rice, rice mill already in operation, yeah. the okay. state government is upbeat of being self-sufficient well, and is optimistic of extending same to its neighboring states. Elsewhere now, ahead of Pope visits to a help of the visit of Pope Francis, the Vatican's technical advance team has been welcomed in Juba, South Sudan. Uh, they are there to assess the preparations for the papal visit, which will take place from February the 3rd through to the 5th. Stephen Ameyu Martin Muller, Metropolitan Archbishop of Juba, uh, says almost 90% of the work uh, that's supposed to be done ahead of the visit has been completed. On the outskirts of Kenya's capital, Nairobi, Rachel Kaboy has earned herself the nickname Catwoman by turning her four-bedroom home into a shelter for an incredible 600 cats. The 51-year-old started the Nairobi feline sanctuary in, in her house in 2020, inspired by the teaching of yoga she learned during a visit to India. Cats, cats, and more cats purring and mewing. Rachel Kabue has them all over the house with hardly any floor space left for humans. Of course, 95% of the space is dedicated to the cats. And then I live in one corner, says Kabue, who is also a mother of five 
and says her children love cats and support the cause. These are animals, they are sentient, just like you and me, and they need care, they feel pain, they feel happiness, they feel sadness, they get depressed, but just like us. So there is no difference, and they are not sinister or anything. It's very hard for a cat to attack a human being. Sometimes you may even provoke a cat, they will not attack you. She takes in cats from the streets that need shelter and medical care and later puts them up for adoption. No cats are too many. What would limit us is the space. We are quickly running out of space, but there are still very many cats that need shelter, that are out there in the streets and need shelter, especially the sick ones and the, the, ones, the ones that are waiting to have kittens. Those are the most vulnerable and they did do need space, but we are quickly running out of space. Despite growing financial costs needed to look after the pets, Kabo is still taking in more cats in need of help and relies on her family to assist with supplies and monetary contributions. Indeed, a feline community there. Well, that's it on Network Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocka Rogers.